Australians elected the federal coalition to office with a thumping majority. Six years on from losing power, and after Labor's Kevin Rudd, Julia Gillard and Rudd returns chaos, the coalition was back in office. I can inform you that the government of Australia has changed for just the second. Tell us uh, about that night when uh, Tony Abbott claimed a, a landslide victory in 2013. Well, firstly, I was elated. <laughs> I was elated. It was a landslide. Tony Abbott led the coalition to a 14-seat majority. You obviously enjoyed hearing it, so let me say it again. The government of Australia has changed. Tony had done an extraordinary job as opposition leader. The most effective, if not more effective, leader, I think, from opposition since Malcolm Fraser. A few more indefatigable, few more uh, relentless than Tony, and always, always fighting. And, uh, you know, that was the nature of opposition, uh, and still is. And I can inform you that the Australian Labor Party's vote is at the lowest level in more than 100 years. <laughs> Lindsay and Lingiari, these are all seats the, the Coalition has picked up tonight. The 2013 campaign really was around three words which came out of the party platform. Hope, reward and opportunity. Hope for the future, reward for hard work and an opportunity for all. When you think of the hope on the night of that initial victory, were those hopes quickly dashed? I don't think they were quickly dashed. Um... The Prime Minister didn't make it till the next election. <laughs> no, he didn't. Um, no, he didn't. The two big personalities were always going to be a problem. Malcolm Turnbull was never going to play second fiddle to anyone. He was always going to be looking for the opportunity when he could take on Tony Abbott, of course, but Tony Abbott was the one that opened the door for him. In the final moments of the election campaign, Abbott summarised his promises. No cuts to education, no cuts to health, no change to pensions, no change to the GST and no cuts to the ABC or SBS. Little more than 24 hours later, he'd won and was pledging to be a man of his word. A government that says what it means and means what it says. But his first budget with Treasurer Joe Hockey in 2014 included cuts and shake-ups in crucial areas like health, public broadcasting and taxation. There's a new petrol tax, there's a new doctor's tax, new taxes on medicines, new taxes on going to the hospital. We have taken a hit because it was necessary for our country. If that means some short-term damage for us, so be it. Come on, Politics, Chris, is the heart of the possible. 2014 budget was mission impossible. The catastrophe for him was the 2014 budget, where he broke a slew of promises. Veteran journalist Chris Yulman has spent most of his career covering Canberra politics. In that budget, he again made the federal government the problem and drew an enormous target around himself. And from that point on, Malcolm Turnbull had an opportunity at some stage to take him if there were more mistakes. And unfortunately, Chris, there were so many more mistakes. But there were significant achievements. Free trade deals with South Korea, Japan and China. The carbon tax was axed and order was restored to our maritime borders. The man charged with stopping the boats was Scott Morrison. We're not going to be intimidated by the weakness of the Greens or the double-mindedness and hypocrisy of the Labor Party. We're not going to be intimidated by any violence that occurs in any centres anywhere or at sea. Our policies are working, Madam Speaker. They are stopping the boats and our resolve is absolute. You come in, you're the hard man, you're hated by the media and the left for doing this job, but what you do in government is stop the boats, therefore saving lives, and get people out of detention. And the Labor Party now adopt it fully as policy and admit they got it wrong. I was thrilled that we were able to achieve the humanity goal of putting an end to this vile trade, but I'm also pleased that the argument was won, I hope, for all time. Australia Day 2015, and the country woke to news about a surprise gong. 
On the day that the Conservatives would love to celebrate, Australia Day, on the 26th of January, someone lobbed a giant turd into the punch bowl and ruined it for everybody. <laughs> Abbott had brought back knighthoods in 2014, but on this day, his captain's call handed the honour to the Queen's husband, Prince Philip. Prince Philip has been a uh, great servant of Australia. I actually would like the knighthoods till we decide to make Prince Philip one. Everybody wake up going, oh man, what, what did we just do? How, how do I answer that one on the telly today? In the words of a coalition insider, not only do his colleagues see this as evidence that the PM is out of touch, Mr Abbott seems to have a death wish. Other comments from inside the coalition included, he's nuts, this is just stupid, and it's hard to bugger up Australia Day, but he's done his best. It was shocking. Can I tell you what happened to me? Absolutely. Because I was happy, right? So I love Australia Day because you get to see a lot of constituents. Happy Australia Day! So I was really looking forward to it. Got the news radio on and I hear that the Prime Minister has pointed to the Duke of Edinburgh as a knight of the realm. And I th won't say what I said, but it starts with F. <laughs> I thought, oh, F, this is going to be a catastrophic day because what a terrible thing to do. And, of course, it ruined the day. Is it an embarrassing decision that we've opted for a Brit? Enjoy, enjoy the day. I, I couldn't understand what the benefit was. The Queen may well have been grateful for that, but it's not as though uh, Prince Philip didn't have a chest full of <laughs> gongs already. So it was, um, it was just a really bad moment. And uh, that was my moment too. Now CEO of the Laundry Association of Australia, Luke Simpkins can't remove the stains of 2015 when he was the Liberal member for Cowan in Western Australia. After so much disappointment through the budget period of 2014, where we seem to have lost our way, and then this, I said, this can't be right. You know, what's going on here? What do you guys think? That really was the moment where uh, I no longer had faith in Tony Abbott as a leader. Was that the moment where many voters lost faith in him as well? It certainly seemed. That's what people were saying. You were trained by Jesuits, so you'd be familiar with a particular exam. Mm -hmm. So, in good conscience, are you the best person to lead this government and prosecute its agenda? And have you considered resigning? Um, yes and no. Yes and no, Chris. Now, let me make it... Let me make it absolutely crystal clear. We were elected in 2013 because the Australian people rejected chaos and we are not going to take them back to that chaos. We really are not going to take them back to that chaos. But that Abbott pledge was about to be broken for him. Within weeks of Australia Day, Luke Simpkins and fellow WA Liberal Don Randall called for a leadership spill prompting a phone call from the Prime Minister. He's obviously agitated, a little bit unhappy, but he wasn't angry, he didn't yell or anything like that, but he told me I was doing the wrong thing for the country and that I was destabilising uh, the government and the country. So what was the point of a spill motion without a challenger? Well, I, I mean, I seriously thought we, we, we could get the numbers and I thought that if, the, if, if we could shake it enough to get the leadership position spilled, then it would be enough for uh, someone to stand up. But no one did. It was a leadership spill without a challenger. So again, they came into this Liberal Party room, 100 MPs, and Tony Abbott, as the Liberal leader, the Prime Minister of the nation, suffered the humiliation of having to have those 100 people vote between him and an empty chair. And the empty chair got 39 votes. The result is very clear. No's 61. Uh, yes, 39. Now this matter is behind us. Turnbull was very clever at this point. Good morning. Good to see you. Turnbull did not declare. If he had declared, he wouldn't have won, Abbott would have won, and Turnbull then would have had to have gone to the back bench. So Turnbull played that very, very cleverly. Did Tony Abbott become isolated from his own party? I, I believe he did. People couldn't get to him when they wanted to. Peter was always there as the gatekeeper and always managed everything that went through. Peter is Peter Credlin, 
now my Sky News colleague, then Tony Abbott's longtime chief of staff. She was fantastic and there's no question about that. But when you become the prime minister of the country, you're expected to step up and be the prime minister and not be seen by colleagues as being manipulated, if you like, or being struggling to make the decisions without the support of your, one of your, your, your senior officer. So You're saying that Tony Abbott couldn't make decisions without Peter Credlin? He, he struggled. He needed her. She was very much part of him and his decision-making process. There's no question about it. She played a very significant role. A role in the rise, obviously. What role did she play then in the fall? Well, you know, I mean, she has to accept some responsibility there because, uh, you know, there were colleagues that were quite disgruntled by the, what was happening. And uh, I'm sure it played a role in their decision to vote against him. Tony needed someone strong at his shoulder because Tony is a very exuberant character and he's such a good guy, but he, he needed a tempering force at times. And I think Peter Credlin, as role of Chief of Staff, did that to sort of like turn down the volume when it had to be turned down. So Peter Credlin helped his prime ministership. Yeah, definitely. Broken election promises, a captain's call on Prince Philip, and the empty chair vote, which he described as a near-death experience. The pugilist prime minister, a one-time Oxford boxing blue, was on the ropes. I've listened, I've learned, I am determined to do better. There were too many people in the party room that didn't like Tony. And there were a couple of catastrophic decisions which caused, you know, a good third of the party room to decide they weren't on the Tony Abbott bus. And one of those was not giving the party room a conscience vote on same-sex marriage. 